Dear students, respected director and the faculty of the institute, and the distinguished speakers, a very good evening to all of you. I'm very happy to be here, and more precisely because I'm fond of talking to young people like you. And the reason behind the same is, I very firmly believe that you have relatively lesser baggage of preconceived notions. And if you believe me, you are at the pinnacle of your learning curve. And as you move along in life, everything will catch up with you and you will have to endeavor to keep your learning curve intact. So please understand this is one of the best time to learn. I will try to relate to you as much as I can and talk to you relevant which is really important at this juncture of your career. You can talk for us on entrepreneurship, family business and so on, but I'll try to be relevant. And to be honest, when I see all of you sitting like this, I feel that I exactly don't know how it feels like sitting like this and listening to somebody because I am a dropout. If you if you might have heard my introduction, you would not have seen anything on education and my colleagues are often embarrassed that they are telling that you have missed out on what is this education qualification. So, I started my career at the age of say around 17 with an intense urge to do something back because of the situation or whatever. And as I wrote in my brief that I have advantage of starting the career only at this age. Uh, I have a practical experience of close to 25 to 27 years. Before I dwell on the subject uh, that is entrepreneurship, the journey of mass and more precisely the family business, I would like to share one very important point with you. I think your next we discuss when uh, we were in the chamber of your director that each one of us have a different question paper in life. So whenever you listen to somebody or whenever you learn anything, don't try to copy others. Because each one of us has a different question paper and when you try to copy somebody, you can go terribly wrong. Keep it to being motivated or being warned. There are certain lives which motivates you. There are certain lives which gives you a warning that never in the life I want to become like this. So it will be a good idea to keep your learning to being motivated or warned and just don't try to copy somebody. That's, that's very important for all of you to understand. Now in next 15-20 uh, minutes, I dwell in three parts. Now first, I very precisely tell what I understand what entrepreneurship is all about. The strategic inflection point through which my company or the way we uh, took the company from uh, almost to 0 to 2000 crores, the strategic inflection point during the journey, and obviously on the family business. I understand that the preciseness you can give to any concept is a function of your, the understanding of that concept. If you understand the concept, you can present it very precisely. And for me, if I define entrepreneurship, I believe that entrepreneurship is all about having a burning desire and determination to succeed. You put any of the entrepreneurship traits and you will find that an entrepreneur, the answer to that is an entrepreneur is having a burning desire and a determination to succeed. Say for example, we say that entrepreneur is a risk taker. Why? Because determined to succeed. He has burning desire to accomplish his goal. Entrepreneurship leads from the front. The same answer. The inter good entrepreneurs have a very high degree of integrity. Why? Because to succeed, integrity is not only a good virtue but a necessity. So to sum up on entrepreneurship, it's all about having a burning desire and determination to succeed. That is what I've learned over all these years. 
Obviously, it has to be systemized into short term, medium term, and long term goals. Obviously, you need to have a very systematic plan of actions, a sharp learning curve. And I would like to share with you one very important thing on goal setting. Once again, I will stick to the basic that for every individual, goal setting will be a different thing. But there is one common denominator to goal setting and that is your aspiration should be greater than your resources at every point of time. I often mentor my colleagues and one of the slides, I never miss a slide, whereby we write A should be greater than R. The aspiration should be greater than your resources. If you stick to that, you will get the best qualities out of you. In terms of execution, as I told you, you should have a sharper learning curve as you grow. It will, it will be a task to be worked upon. It's not an easy task. You can never, never say that, okay, I have a learning curve or at, at the sharpest level, you will have to work upon it day in, day out. So that is, this is what my take on entrepreneurship is all about. Now I will share with you a few of the strategic inflection points in my journey that how we grew from say practically a lakh rupees of a balance sheet size to currently 2000 crores and to be very candid with you fairly happy but yet to be satisfied <laughs> we uh, one of the tagline what I gave to this company was miles to go promises to king this is, this is what you call it as a belief that your miles to go promises to keep and together we can and we will. So the first job, see, one of the traits of, of an entrepreneur is to be irrational. You will not find entrepreneurs to be so rational in their behavior and the way they look at things. The first thing what we did that I had no money and I thought that we would be a financer. When we started in 1988, we started as a marketing company. We were marketing consumer durables to the employees of various institutes and more precisely the government uh, institutes. Because I can approach the credit societies, I can approach the unions and sell it in bulk. And at that time, final, consumer finance was not in vain. People don't use to borrow to buy consumer durables. So I thought that if we can package finance bill along with this selling of consumer duty bill, I can increase my sales. So we started uh, looking around and who can lend us some money on this business model. And there was one gentleman who, who happened to my brother's friend. He told that I will, I will commit one lakh of rupees, but I won't give you at a stretch. I will, I will give you as and when you have orders and as and when you want need to satisfy some customers, financial needs. Is it fine? So this is the first strategic inflection point that despite of having no money, we start, we thought that we should package the finance along with consumer durable. And that is what I call having a burning desire to do something. I wanted to sell more than what a particular dealer would sell. Let me tell you a, a very small thing in this, that when I went to various companies to get this dealership, they told that you don't have a showroom, how are you going to market consumer durables without showroom? And that is where I pitched in that I am going to help the dealers increase their sale by approaching various government institutes and I had a point to prove that I can sell much more than what a conventional dealer can sell. Now. The next strategic inflection point was we didn't know where the another leg is going to come. We exhausted that one leg, we were just churning that. And I was moving from government offices to government offices to market as consumer durables along with finance. At young age, you get offended very quickly, isn't it? <laughs> so that happened to me. Uh, not treated nicely at one of the offices. I still remember that was an uh, office on the Ashram Road stretch. And on that day I decided that I'm not going to leave a single office on this stretch and I'm going to approach everybody. 
And then the next of his event was a bank. Would you imagine selling finance to a bank? <laughs> but it was with, it was within me decided that I'm going to have, I'm not going to leave a single office on this stretch. And to my pleasant surprise, I met the general manager. He told me, will you meet my managing director? I, I, was, I was a little perplexed at first. But I thought, well, let's do it. I have nothing to lose. And when I met him, he told me that this is what exactly we are looking at to fund government employees to buy small tickets and give them small ticket size funding because this bank has lost a lot of money funding businessmen in industry analysts. That bank was under administration. There was, a, there was an administrator from the cooperative department who was running that bank. And see, a bank cannot run without lending, right? You are all common students, you know. You need to lend. So since they are stock financing to business people and the, they are stock financing to uh, industries, they need to land somewhere and they told me that if you can get me an arrangement whereby the installments are directly deducted from the salaries of the employees, I'll be in a position to finance your customers. That was the biggest strategic inflection point in the career of Marx. We grabbed that opportunity, we sold this business model to other cooperative banks. We increased the number of customers. The customers later on became our depositors. And then we started growing. And if I talk about the next inflection point was taking the competition from a multinational. And uh, I think all of you might be kids at that time. I'm talking about 1998 and 2000. In the very industry where we are working, that is financing consumer durables, a giant of America, that is G, and the biggest financer of India, that is HDFC, they joined hands and formed a company which was known as Countrywide at that time. And they entered the same field, that is financing consumer durables. Given their size, given their stature, it was a question of existence then. Once again, the same trade wire believes so much in burning desire and determination to succeed. We sat across, found out what is the best bet, how can we survive. And we found out that on a detailed analysis, that spreading the wings and creating a distribution arm will be the best bet. So we started working in Tire 2 and Tire 3 cities. Today, this is our biggest USP. We are working at around 3,200 3, centers from over 79 branches. So this is, these are the strategic inflection point at every point. What I'm trying to drive a point home is, that every time you are challenged, take this challenge as an opportunity turned inside out. It's an opportunity. And then we had other people entering the frame, the, the local people, the local banks into consumer and retail financing. And that is where we identified the missing middle and the lower uh, of the pyramid, the people at the lower of the pyramid, the BPL, what they call it, the notch above BPL, I call it that there is a huge opportunity in serving the self-employed and non-professional. I, I would not have liked that uh, definition to come here because recently we have rephrased it to self-employed and self-organized. Let's move away from negative notions. That is, I don't like the way we are called non-banking finance companies. We would be better off if we are called as near banks. So, the, the self-organized uh, uh, segment, a huge segment. See, uh, according to me, whatever GDP numbers we are getting are not accurate. 
because we are not in a position to incorporate the non unorganized sector. There's not incorporated. And there's a huge sector. So we thought that it will be our it will be a good idea to start serving this sector. And we started serving that sector and then in 2000 it was recognized as the key driver of the economy as the microfinance as as the as the uh, sector having the highest potential in terms of growth and that will contribute to the hence it will contribute to the development of an economy the next point what i like to discuss with you on the strategic inflection i i I'll take to i see some anxious faces that is not going to end on the strategic inflection thing uh, there will be two more uh, which i think i should share with you the next point is as you grow uh, if you if you heard the profile we have a few development banks as our investors uh, in the capital and debt is a raw material for a financial services company so we have to raise capital and debt from time to time but we had a very we have a firm determination that we don't want to run this company as a minority shareholder So when we took the first investment, uh, the, the first investment was from bad weather. It was hardly one million dollar. I'm not talk much about it. Our first major investment came from Development Bank of Netherlands, that is FMO, and they offered us to invest ten million dollars in us. At that time, we were served two hundred, and at at that time, the the rupee dollar ratio was forty rupees. So it, it turned out to be forty crores. And on a very liberal valuation, the company was not valued more than 100 crores at that time. So the option was to give away 40% of the stake to the investor. If I do two such rounds, then I would be a minority stakeholder. I will be reduced to an employee. I would have to run according to the whims and fences of the investor, which I never wanted to do. And when you, I mean, if you approach a consultant, or if you approach a merchant banker, he says it's very you can't get, get, eat the cake and keep it too. If you want capital, you need to dilute. At that time of our own, we came out with, I don't call it a novel. It's already there in the books. If you study the convertible instruments, what we call it. So we gave them the convertible preference shares, which gets converted at a later on date. So you don't have to get into the jargons of valuing the company right now. Let me share with you that I firmly believe that you are not what you are, you are what you want to be. So I told that we are not 100 crores. This company is not worth 100 crores. There's much more than that. I can't give you 40% for just 40 crores. So they invested in 2006, uh, 2008 rather. The first term of investment for six years, in 2014, they renewed the investment for another four years. So they remain invested in our company for 10 years and in the same pattern. We have not diluted a single percentage of share to them. And then we developed this business model. On the same way we attracted Development Bank of Germany, in the same way we attracted low capital that is uh, uh, founded by IDFC chairman Rajiv Lal and there are a few more in the pipeline and today if the company wants to give exit to all of them and at a modest valuation we don't have to dilute more than 20 percent so this is this is what makes me think that if you are determined to succeed if you are burning desire there are very high probabilities to achieve that. Let me tell you, there are no guaranteed formulas in life. There are high probability to achieve that. But if you don't achieve and still you stick on to what you want, one day you'll get it. And let me, uh, uh, let me again tell you that at the time when we started our entrepreneurship journey, today we are talking about, uh, I'm, I'm very happy at the imagination of our Prime Minister. It really matters a lot 
where a person who matters really starts imagining. We can imagine a lot, but what difference can we make to this country? But if a Prime Minister imagines in the right direction, it makes a lot of difference. Today is talking about do, uh, doing ease of doing business, right? It sounds like a music to our ears because we have grown up in during all these years as to every time we feel like everybody's asking everybody's telling us why are you doing business? That was that that was the concept. So if you are determined, if you are uh, if your execution plans are at place and if you believe in yourself the very high chances to succeed and the last one in the strategic inflection if I tell you I told that we are partnering with number of NDFs, smaller NDFs. I don't know you people read newspaper very regularly and uh, you can't uh, uh, be excused under the guise that you are too young I'm talking about 2011 the 2011 microfinance crisis, that you, is anybody aware of it? That's an economic times, not within your purview of reading, is it? <laughs> <laughs> so there was a famous microfinance, infamous I'll call it, microfinance crisis, that just because of a misjudgment of a single state, that is Andhra Pradesh, the whole sector was on verge of getting wiped off. And at that stage, we decided to fund that sector. The size of that sector as of now is close to 25,000 crores. And our contribution in that sector is anywhere between 3 to 4 percent. Having some percentage share of a complete sector is, is a fit in itself. So we trusted our conviction. We thought this is a wonderful business model. It's just a one-off case in one-off state. We convinced the board, we convinced our lenders, and today we are among the most prominent funders to this sector. So this was all about the strategic inflection points, the key inflection points which I thought I should share with you. We aim to be close to a billion dollar enterprise in the next three to five years and if you see our mission, we want to create a value on a very large scale, that's a long term. Now, I would like to come to the topic which I'm expected to talk about, that's a family business. I think the most relevant thing to talk on family business right now at this juncture is not how you are going to manage your family business. The most relevant question is, are you going to make an informed decision to join your family business? Is your decision to join the family business an informed one or not? I think who hail from business family, that must be two distinct type of thoughts going on in your mind. One, little confused, tentative, whether I should join, whether I should not join. The second one, who by their birthright means they have conceived that joining the family business is my birthright. Irrespective of what is in store for me. <laughs> so it is very important to have an informed decision. Forget about all surveys and statistics. Let me tell you, we have seen so many of our friends who lack quality engagement. I'm not talking about money. They might be having money. He says that I have, I will land at somewhere, some, at some place. It was 20 lakhs 20 years ago. It's already 20 crores. So I can sell it off and I have a lot of money. Fair enough. If you keep all surveys and statistics around the world aside, we have seen ourselves that people who have not taken informed decision on joining a family business, they lack quality engagement. There is no quality engagement. The work they are doing, they are not satisfied. They don't know what are they adding value. So I would like to share with you a few things what you should ask yourself before you decide to join your family business. 
the very first and the foremost question you're going to ask yourself is, is my existing family business scalable and sustainable? Do, will I have a role to play in that family business where I can add value? Let me share with you that around the globe, two-thirds of the businesses are family-owned. That's huge. Two-thirds of the family businesses around the world are family-owned. But this is the largest sector which generates disguised unemployment. This is going to generate disguised unemployment because they are not adding any value. So if you think that I want to be gainfully employed, I want to contribute positively, you have to check out whether this is sustainable and scalable. If the answer is yes, you are all to play there. The second thing which I think the guardians and the parents should also work out is a reasonably clear succession plans. Reasonably clear. I'm not talking about you that you go to your father or guardian and tell them that just show me your will. What, what, what is that in store for me? They'll kick you out before you join. <laughs> but you should have a reasonable, reasonable understanding on the succession plans. If I give you two extremes, it ranges from a very simple succession plan, a father and a son, obvious, is going to take over. To the most complex father of three brothers, half a dozen of cousins already working into it, and you will be one more adding the, to the tally. Understand what role I'm going to play here. What will I be after five years, seven years, ten years? If you don't have the answer to this, you will waste majority of your time proving your existence. Proving that I am here, you have to tell everybody that I am here. The moment you, you have to tell somebody that I am here, that means you are not working. That is what I was talking to Abhishek, that your actions speak louder than words. We know you through your movies. I didn't know who Abhishek Jaimi is, but I knew your, I know your movies. Proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very important that you have a reasonable understanding on the succession plans. The third thing what you're going to ask to yourself is, are you reasonably excited and do you have good compatibility with the people you are going to work? And in this I will add that if the answer is 4 out of 10, it's a good answer. Because the excitement and compatibility comes as you work along. It is not there from right from the first day. You say that, okay, I am reasonably excited the way my father or uncle is doing. Let's see what happens. Or you say that he is a wonderful dad. But God forbids her to work with him. <laughs> so you have to work out that what sort of compatibility do you have. If you, if you don't focus on this, you will not do good in business, but at the same time you will lose one of the most worthy relationships of life. And the last one, what I like to focus upon is don't afraid to take a detour. Do you all know what is detour? And I was it. Try or try what is going there in your mind. In, in the essence, let me, let me tell you, in some of the family business, it is a practice whereby a person who wants to join the family business should compulsorily work outside the family. So you know what the real world is. You know what are you made up of, what you like. You can do that. You can try something of your own, what is already going there in your mind. With a very open mindset at both the ends, from the family as well as from your end, that I can join this business anytime. I think it's, it's a good time to join. It's a good idea. So I, very, I, I believe that if you take an informed decision to join the family business, it will pay you very rich dividends going forward. I don't think we should talk much about managing family business and uh, even business school takes two years to tell you what happens in family, how to run a family business. The various courses going in the, the, around the globe. The best way to run your family business that you will learn is learn through training, through education, 
and through experience. But I, I always believe that there are no rules to the game. There are no hard ever rules. That this is it, it works for this guy. He is educated from this university, so, so I'm going to do that. I, I, this, this is when, uh, when I get a little disappointed, even in youngsters. And you have sort of a herd mentality. Uh, if, if somebody goes to LSE for a summer school, summer training, you think, oh, I, I should go to LSE. And then you ask a straight question, what's the objective? Then uh, I wonder, is he answering or are you asking me questions? <laughs> I don't know. So it's very important that you take an informed decision. If you take an informed decision, managing your family business, will be relatively easy and let me tell you from my experience that it's a wonderful experience to be an entrepreneur provided you build up that trait of burning desire determined to succeed and that element of irrationality in you I uh, just on the lighter way I always tell my auditors and lawyers that I can wriggle out of any contract you make me sign. <laughs> he says, why? I tell them that one of the essence to a contract is the person who signs the contract should be of sound mind. <laughs> and entrepreneurship and sound mind doesn't go together. <laughs> so, so don't, don't, but take it in the right spirit. Don't start behaving in a wild manner and tell that we are all entrepreneurs. I think that I will not be called the next time. So that's all from me. I wish all of you all the success and I wish that I will see you somewhere sometime as a very successful entrepreneur. Thank you. Thank you.